All right, so welcome to Jumpstart session number two, week number two for you guys. Um, gosh, I hope week number one went well for you and you made progress moving in the right direction. Uh, let's go through, start off right out of the gate with a recap of, of what we were doing yesterday. I always like to start these sessions off with something about mindset, and the reason being is because no matter what's happened over the last week, the best thing we can do is make sure your mind is going in the right direction first and you're thinking the right way and we're working the right way and we're feeling the right way. And if we can get that going, then the rest of the stuff starts to fall into place. So pretty much every single time I've worked with a real estate agent and they said, you know, my business isn't doing that great. I got this issue, this issue, this issue. The first question I always ask is what's going on at home? What's going on in your personal life? What's going on up here, right? And I know if this is a mess, the rest of it's going to be a mess. If your home's a mess, the rest of your business is going to be a mess. Very seldom in life have I had somebody say, my business is amazing and everything else in my life is a disaster. Usually it's like, my business is a disaster because everything else in my life is a disaster. So those two do dovetail and tie together. When you get the secret recipe really put together going in the right direction, your home life and your business life, your personal life, and everything starts to really click along when you get this built right and dovetail right. So a big part of this Jumpstart Masterclass program is about giving you the ability to have the right things going the right direction, working on the right stuff, doing the right things on a day-to-day -day basis so that the, the life stuff can still happen so you can keep your life going in a straight direction. I know I've got a guy that reached out to me last night about a property here in Detroit, and I was just like, I, I don't have time for this. I got blah, 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 blah. And it, you, you have these things that derail you, and it's like people want to call you at the most inconvenient times, right? So Jay and I were talking before you guys all got on briefly, and I was like, I'm heading south here in a couple weeks. And of course, because I'm heading south, I've got a friend of mine's uncle who's been talking about listing for six months, wants to list his house next week. So every time I've got something important to do or something that I can't move, or I'm going to be scheduled out of town and it's not negotiable, somebody wants to list a house with me on one side or the other. So it's like, I've always said this to people over the years, if you want to do more business, book more vacations. I mean, pay for the ticket, pay for the hotel, lock everything down, prepay everything, and you'll probably end up with enough, you'll end up with a deal that ends up paying for the thing. It's just it's like a Murphy's Law of realtors going on vacation. The day before vacation, everything in the world's got to break loose. Those people you've been talking to for six months, a year, they're finally like, you know, I'm ready to go look at houses tomorrow. And I'm like, I'm jumping on a plane tomorrow. And that's why you always have people around you that can back you up when you go out of town. Because <laughs> you don't skip the vacation. You take the vacation, let somebody else do the work. You get paid, they pay for the vacation, and you got a vacation for free. Good way to do business, right? I had a real estate agent that was working for me in 2010, and she's like, I think my plan is I'm going to book a vacation every other week, and then I can have two transactions per year, <laughs> or two transactions per month, every month, for the rest of the year. And I said to her, you know, that's actually probably not a real bad idea that actually we could, we could probably statistically pan that one out to work, right? So let's get right into the goal part of the game. The mindset part of the game is about getting out of life what you want. So here's a process that I've walked through many, many times with a lot of real estate agents, uh, because what we do is just like Americans and humans, right? What we do is we focus on goals. We focus on an end result. And I actually started you on that process to say, what do you actually want your life to look like? What do you want your business to look like? Start establishing clear-cut goals and directions. What do you want it to look like, right? And what we call that is a result, right? So we are results-oriented people. People say, Russ, I'm a results-oriented guy. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Great. Fantastic. So here's the rub. People are focused on results, but when you start saying, okay, well, where do your results come from? the brain starts breaking down and they start losing track of like, what are we actually doing? Where are we actually going? The results part is like, that's the end. That's the end of the race, right? Well, how did we get there? So what, uh, what creates results? Jay, what do you think? What do you think creates results? Uh, where they, in action. Where do they come from? Actions, right. Okay. So here's the reality of things. The reality of things, if you want something as a result, You've got to do something to get something. So a lot of times when I'm talking to real estate agents and they're struggling and they're saying, well, this is what I want. I'm like, good, we got clear on that. So what have you been doing? And then they're like, ah, well, I'm doing this and this and this and this. Oh, okay, great. So if you look at your life right now, your results are 
the result of the things that you've done oh, see, since you were born or in the last two, three, four, five weeks, two, three, four, five years, right? So you're saying the house that you live in, the people that you're surrounded with, the people you have relationships with, the dogs that you have, the cats that you have, the birds that you own, the vacations that you take, the amount of money in your bank account, your waistline is a result. It's a result of all of the things you've done, even they're in the recent or near past or longer term past, right? So the things that you do created those results. So if you're not happy with where you are, you're not happy with here, the first thing I'm gonna to say to you is we gotta change an action. So if we don't change an action, guess what's gonna happen? We get the same result, right? So you've heard the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and expecting a different result. If I do the same thing over and over, I'm gonna get the same result. If me and my wife are having issues, my wife and I are having issues, and it's because I'm acting like a jerk and doing blah, blah, blah. The result is we're not going to have a good relationship. So I've got to do something different, take control of what I do. Whether it's an action or a reaction, I still have to control what I do in order to make sure on my half, I've done my job to have a good relationship. So when I look at a relationship with a person or with my wife or anybody else, I always go back to what am I doing? What am I doing? How am I acting or how am I reacting, right? So my wife can say certain things to me, been married 25 years, she can say certain things to me, and my blood just goes, Phew! I'm a very patient person, I don't get angry very often, very rare to get angry. My wife and I have, have actually had a yelling match maybe like twice in our whole marriage, um, and she won both of them, so that's why we don't keep doing that. So, um, but the reality is, it's like, I look at, it's like, what did I do, what did I do, how did I do, or how did I react to that? It's like, what did she say versus what I react? And when we go backwards and, and rerun re the tape, she's like, what I said was this. And I'm like, what I thought you said was, <laughs> right? So our results are from our actions. And sometimes it's what we're doing. And sometimes it's how we're reacting to what other people are doing, right? So ultimately, we are in control of our results. Almost all of our results we're in control of. There are oddities that happen every once in a while people get in car accidents planes crash stuff happen buildings burn down that kind of stuff does happen but in, if, aside from that stuff we are in charge of our results by what we do so when people say well russ but i don't know i don't know i don't know i don't know i was like okay let's look at your bank account as an example you 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 have exactly what you deserve in your bank account and most people go, well that's not fair i can't well that doesn't that's not right well, yeah, it is because people say, well, I'm a great real estate agent. I'm a real estate expert. I said, are you being paid like an expert? Are other people treating you like an expert by paying you like an expert? If they're not, then you're not really an expert. You're just saying you're an expert. So when you start going, okay, if I act like an expert, talk like an expert, deliver value like an expert, the result is people are going to say that guy's an expert, right? So when you look at your bank account and you say, how much money am I making per hour? If you're making 10, 15, $20 an hour, $50 an hour, you're not really an expert. An expert is going to be in three to $500 an hour. So you can literally say, how, okay, so how do I increase the amount of money that I make? It's going to be the things that you do. And a huge part of this program is about making sure you're doing the right stuff. So you go from being a realtor to being an expert. And then the next level above expert is what? Do you know what the next level above expert is, Kristen? You're on mute. No. I said no. <laughs> <laughs> I should be able to read lips better. Hold on. Let me read your lips. Okay. So the next, so, so here's the thing. A lot of people get this confused. They're like, well, I want to be a real estate expert, Russ. And I'm like, yeah. And then the next level is being a real estate consultant. And now you guys might be saying, well, Russ, isn't an expert higher than a consultant? I would say actually not. An expert is going to actually have a harder time making money than a consultant. So here's the deal. I'm a real estate person. I'm also a real estate expert. I know all the real estate information. I have all the knowledge base. I have a large, vast understanding. I'm an expert in this and mastered a bunch of different avenues of real estate. I know all kinds of experty stuff. The problem is if I don't have the ability to communicate that and make it make sense to you, Kristen, on a day-to-day -day basis and how to apply it to you, then it's virtually wasted. It's completely useless. Have you met any real estate agents that are ridiculously knowledgeable, but they don't make any money? They could be, sure. they're an expert, but they're not actually a consultant. So the consultant level, while it may, most people say, well, that's actually a lower level or something. Like, no, actually it's not if you want to make money. So an expert, a consultant is a person who's able to take the information they have 
and help you apply it to your situation, Kristen, so that you are able to actually make good decisions, which will help you make more money, right? So I want to say, let's take it to the next level. Know your business, know your stuff, learn the nuts and bolts stuff, learn your market info, learn all the mechanics of it, and then learn how to actually communicate this to other people. So I can say, I know all the market stats, but if I'm not able to communicate it to you, Kristen, so that you understand it and show you how to make it make sense for you and apply it for you, it makes it really hard for you to do anything with it, right? Last time I sat down and talked to somebody that was an actual rocket scientist, and they're explaining, like, explain to me how this works. And they're like, Phew! and they went right out, like, explain it to a dummy how it works, right? They're like, you understand things at a level that I don't, you know, like, speak in a completely different language. Use, like, use, like, uh, fifth grader language. And then I'll actually get it. And he said, like, oh, well, well, the, the thing goes boom and it goes up. I'm like, perfect, right? Now, now I get it, right? So you got to be able to break it down and make it make sense, not just bury people in crap, right? So your actions and the way you do things, the way you say things, where you are, what you're doing, and how you're acting, the things you're doing are what creates your results. So where do your actions come from, Kristen? Uh, your thoughts. Okay, close. Got one missing. <laughs> it's something that's missing in most men. Oh, I could go on and on. <laughs> 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 that was a good one okay so what's the big one feelings bingo <laughs> right so so we all break out this our feelings <laughs> nothing but the feelings right so men notoriously devoid of feelings and what you will find ladies is men aren't devoid of feelings they just actually don't let you see their feelings they're really great at hiding them we all have them so uh you know, ladies, you have this famous thing called women's intuition, right? Kind of gives you that feeling and that you know something, right? Guys have women's intuition too. You know that, Jay, right? You have women's intuition too. We just call it a different name because I don't want to call mine women's intuition because it makes me sound girly. I call mine gut feelings, right? <clears throat> it's more, when I have a feeling on something, it's a like gut feeling, right? Because it sounds more manly to me. But really, it's just... It's just the way you feel, right? So what happens in this whole system is people say, well, Russ, I want a different result. I want a different bank account. I want a different waistline. I want a different business. I want a different life. I want a different wife. I want a different car, whatever that looks like. I want more vacation time. I want more downtime. I want to control my schedule more. I was like, okay, great. So what are we going to do to get there? I just like, okay, here's some of the actions I need to be doing. And then the problem is they go, okay, so why do you do something or not do something? What makes you do something or not do something, Kristen? I think it's going to make you feel better, you know. Sure, right? Mm. It really does come down to feelings. Because if you feel like doing something, you're going to do it. If you don't feel like doing something, you're not going to do it. So when we get into this real estate business, right, I hear this all the time, and it grinds the hell out of me because it's just completely against my wiring system. You hear people talk about banging the phone and chasing people around and and cold calling people. Those words do not register in my brain and the way I want to do business at all. I don't want to chase business. I want business to come to me. I want to do the things that business can. People go, Russ, I need you to help me out with this. Perfect. That's a perfect scenario. If I have to go, hey, my name is Russ Lagan. I'm thinking about, do you know anybody thinking about buying or selling real estate? No, click. Hey, this is Russ Lagan with real estate. Do you know anybody thinking about buying or selling real estate in the next two weeks? No, click. And people just literally bang through, bang through, bang through, bang through. And I'm telling you, you can make money doing that. But the people that actually do that and feel like doing that, they'll do it a little bit. And then they kind of like, I really don't enjoy this. I don't want to do this. I don't feel good doing this. If somebody did this to me, I would hang up on them. So when you're doing something to other people that you don't want done to you, some per I had a person the other day say, well, Russ, do you think I should go door knocking? I was like, I don't know. Do you like it when people knock on your door? Well, no, I hate it when people come to my door and like trying to sell me crap. I'm like, then why would you do that to other people, right? So what happens is when we're doing something that is not in line with what we feel and what we like and don't like, then we have a real conflict on our hands and we're less likely to do it. So when somebody says, well, you know what I need to do is I need to call more expired. So it's like, do you feel, do you like doing expired calls? If you were a person that had a problem with a sale, would you want somebody to be calling you, giving you a hard time or one of 30 other people calling you? Would you like that? Well, not really. Like, then why would you do it to other people? right? 
if you're the kind of person who's like, no, yeah, I mean, if my deal blew up and my real estate agent was an idiot and, uh, and I need to still sell my house, I, of course I'd want to have somebody else. I, I would wish somebody would reach out to me that way. Perfect, right? So that's a person that's in line with their feelings. So if you start getting your thinking and your feelings in line, your actions are going to be way better, right? Because your actions aren't happening and you're not doing the things that you've committed to doing. The reason you're not doing that is because you don't feel like it. Now, Kristen, here's a good one. Why do you feel like something or not feel like something? I don't know. Maybe the, oh, well, thoughts for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I feel like, you know, it's an outcome. Like whatever is going to, you know, sure. produce a certain result, I guess. Sure. Absolutely. So, so what happens is when we don't feel like doing something, I can always go, okay, so what are you thinking? Well, you know. If you really dig into it, I'm like, you know, Jay, why, why aren't you making those cold calls? Well, you said you're going to make 100 calls a week. Why aren't you doing it? You know, I, I don't really feel like it. Why don't you feel like it? Well, you know, I, I mean, I don't really, if somebody did that to me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't appreciate it if somebody did it to me. So I don't want to do it to somebody else. So you're thinking, if you're not thinking that that's the right thing, if you think this is the right thing to do, I'm going to do this. I don't mind if somebody did this to me. I think this is a great way to build my business. I can get everything I want and the results out of it that I want. I'm going the right direction. Are you more likely to do it? Of course, because you feel like you're doing the right thing and you're going the right direction. But if you're thinking, hey, I hate doing this, are you going to feel like doing it? Of course you're not, right? So, so here's a perfect example. I've had this conversation a couple of times. I've had the pleasure of officiating a couple of weddings, by the way. Uh, all, all three of the weddings that I've officiated the last couple of years, they're all still together, which is great. So I'm like batting a thousand, which is good. So I'm only going to officiate weddings. But if I think they can go the long haul, I'll do the wedding. If I don't think they can do the long haul, I find other places to be like Australia. <laughs> right? So kind of like I got to figure out a way to, to stay in contact with these people and make sure that they're moving in the right direction. So I have this conversation and I, I mentioned this when I'm talking about weddings. I say, here's the thing that's really important for you to understand. And you'll hear people say this, and they'll say, Russ, you know, we just fell out of love. Like, there's no such thing as falling in love and falling out of love. That is actually the byproduct of thinking in love or thinking out of love, right? So if you are thinking kind, wonderful thoughts, it's like Kristen Ferry is my favorite person in the world. She's so beautiful. I love her hair, the twinkle in her eyes, the beautiful smile. She's always friendly. She's always happy. I love hugging her, squeezing her, and hanging around with her. She's the most amazing person in the world. If somebody's thinking that, what do they want to do? So if somebody's like, hey, man, that, she sounds awesome, right? If you're like, Kristen's such a pain in the ass. I'm sick of listening to her crap. I don't want to hear her voice. I don't want to hear her nonsense about stupid cats all the time that she's talking about. I don't want to talk about, well, I don't know. If you're saying and thinking bad stuff about somebody, you're going to feel bad stuff about somebody. So if you feel bad stuff about somebody, how are you going to act? Are you going to act kind and patient and thoughtful? Are you going to act like you're in love? Absolutely not. So when you're thinking about any relationship you're in, if your relationship is good, it's probably because you're feeling good and you're acting good, right? That's the result. Good relationship is a result of good action. Good actions are a result of, of good feelings. Good feelings are a result of good thoughts. So if I say to somebody, hey, well, what are you thinking? And they go, well, blah, 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 blah. I go, well, it's no wonder you feel that way, right? It's like, well, how do you, what are you thinking about your spouse? On a day-to-day -day basis, what do you think? So it's no, it's just frustrating. It's not what I thought it would be, blah, 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 blah. Well, then that creates a feeling, right? So when you look at your relationship, if you want your relationships to be better, business and personal relationships to be better, you got to get into what am I thinking? On every single thing you do, Jay, everything you do, Susanna, everything you do, for now, everything you do, you got to say, what am I thinking about this? Because I know if I can control what I think, and I only allow myself to think good thoughts, I like Kristen, Kristen is awesome, she's friendly, she's cute, she's funny, she's fun to hang out with, I really like her a lot. If you say those things about people and focus on the things that you like, you're going to feel a lot better. If you focus on the things that you don't like, you're going to feel worse, which can act, act worse, and your result is going to be bad. So think about it this way. You don't fall out of love. You think out of love. Well, over the last couple of years, Russ, you know, we just kind of fell out of love. No, you stop thinking out of love. So instead of your dominant thoughts being, she's my favorite person in the world. I can't wait to spend time with her. Remember the first couple of weeks when you met somebody you really dig? Like, I can't wait to be around them. 
and you're thinking, I can't wait to be around. There's so many, uh, and you're focusing on the things that you like. If you stop focusing on the things you like and start focusing on the things you don't. You know, that stupid cough that he has really drives me crazy. The way he says that word drives me crazy. I really hate the fact that he burps in public. And you know what? He wears his pants hanging down too low and his hair standing too high. The hoop, what, he doesn't, he's got a skull on his shirt. Oh, my gosh. Right? Some people are like, that's cool. Other people are like, whatever. You know? But if you're focusing on the crappy stuff and the things you don't like, you're going to feel bad. And then you're going to actually have results that aren't good. Right? So that works in your personal life. And it's really important that you understand that because it carries over into your business life. So if you walk into a listing appointment going, oh, these people are going to be a pain in the ass. I mean, these people are dirty. I don't know if I'm going to get this done. If you walk in thinking thoughts that aren't going to support you, you're going to radiate that feeling and your actions are going to be a little bit tougher and your results are going to suck, right? So if I walk into listing saying, hey, I'm a listing badass. I can list any single house in this world. I don't care who shows up. I don't, have, I don't even care if I have to complete, compete against Jay Alderson. I'm going to go in. I'm going to kick butt and take names. That's what I'm thinking going in. I'm going to feel strong. And when I walk in with confidence, I'm going to act confident. People are going to say, dude, I'm following that guy. That guy seems like he's got a plan. He's confident. If you're confident and enthusiastic, you can be a complete idiot and people will follow you. It works for listings. It works with buyers. A little bit of enthusiasm, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of extra push, a little bit of excitement, and people are going to want to follow you. So you're saying, well, I'm having trouble getting people to do what I need them to do. Well, are you walking in with a strong plan with confidence and enthusiasm? I can say the same thing to somebody that you say to them, and they get two completely different results. Because I'm going to say, I mean, <laughs> think about this. So this is an example I gave the other day to somebody I was talking. I can't remember who I was talking to, but it's really funny. Um, it's like, the, the, you heard the nursery rhyme? Hey, uh, hey diddy, uh, diddle, diddy, diddle, uh, cat's in the middle, the cow jumped over the moon. Okay? How does that how does that go? You guys remember that? What is that? How does, that, that, that was me talking to you, but I don't remember it. Hey, 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 hey diddle, diddle, the cat in the middle, the middle, cow jumped, cow jumped over, over the moon, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so there you go. Okay, so I was talking to uh, what I was talking to, yeah, what's his name? He just popped out here a second ago. I, um, I was talking to him, I was like, so you can say one thing just like that. This nursery rhyme like that, right? And then you can take that same thing and run it through Aerosmith, right? Same exact nursery rhyme with Aerosmith, right, Alex? And how does that go? You want to sing it for me? <laughs> I sung it for Alex. Here we go. Hey, nope. you put your kitty in the middle and a wave that just don't care. <laughs> Same exact words. Said completely differently, and he sold a million albums with that, right? So you take literally a stupid nursery rhyme, put a cool tune to it, say it with enthusiasm, and it completely changes the way people react to it. Instead of people going, oh, yeah, I like that nursery rhyme. Well, when Steven Tyler sings that nursery rhyme, people pay money for it, right? So that you got to think, how do I get this result? The result is I want people to do more what you're doing. The action is a little bit of enthusiasm, a little bit of passion. Show a little bit of that, and then people are more likely to do what you want them to do. And that comes from the way you think. I'm going to go in. I'm going to feel good. So when I walk up to a listing appointment, it's like, okay, ready to rock and roll. I got this. I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm at. I've got a plan. I'm going to tell a story. When we're talking about the price, I'm going to tell them a story that helps it make sense. They understand where they're priced, not just telling them a number, and then they're going to probably do the right thing and follow me along because it's going to make sense. And that's what ends up happening. Somebody's like, well, I don't know if I'm going to get this one or not. Well, shoot, now you just gave yourself a 50-50 shot. So literally everything you do, the results you have from going to a listing appointment, working with a buyer, if you expect buyers to be liars, they're, you're going to find their liars, right? Where I say, I expect buyers to not know what we know, and then when we ask them questions, they don't really know what we know, so they give us answers thinking that they're giving us the right answer when in fact they gave us the wrong answer because they don't know the rest of the perspective. And from my perspective, say, okay, if I'm getting people telling me one thing and then doing another, then it's probably because I need to ask better questions. So I blame myself. So my thought is if I ask the right questions, the better questions, they're more likely to get the better result. So I start blaming myself first, right? I take responsibility first for my actions and what I do. And so this carries over into all of your business. This carries into everything you're working in your sphere of influence. So my mindset is, 10% of the people that I know, like, and trust and deliver value to on a consistent basis are going to do business with me. That's the equation right there. And I know it works. I believe it works. I think it works. I feel it works. I act like it works, and, I tr and, and it does have the results because I've seen it happen, right? And I believe it's going to continue happening. So now the question of the day is, where do your, where do your thoughts come from? Alex, where do your thoughts come from, kid? Uh, from your motivators. 
Good, yeah. Partially, right? So your, your thoughts come from your past programming. You might say, well, Russ, what the heck is that? Past programming is the things that you've seen, done, and experienced give you the wiring set that you have. So here's the jacked up part. And I tell this to women all the time, Alex, you might want to learn this phrase because you're still young, right? I know you got a girl, but you're still young. So learn this phrase, right? Past program. So you're always, you are always right. You want to stop every argument in the world? You just look at it and say, you know what? You're right. So here's the problem. They are right from their past, their experience, what they've seen, what they've done, how they were raised, things that have happened to them, things that have not happened to them, things they wished for that happened, things they wished for that didn't happen, create your past programming. So from everybody's perspective, when you start looking at them going, everybody else is right, they're all right. They're just right from their perspective. The problem is my perspective is different because my experience is different. So while I might look at something and say, that's crazy, other people go, that makes perfect sense to me. Why doesn't it make sense to you? From my experience, I would never do that because last time I saw that done, somebody got sued, right? You might be like, never seen that before. So to them, it's not that big of a deal. I never would have thought that, right? So you've got to look at every single aspect of your business. And what happens is we start, we really judge our businesses a lot, right? So when things happen in our business, we judge us like, well, this is crazy. That's nuts. So you first thing in my head goes, okay, they're right. In their mind, they're right. So then how could that, what could they have experienced in the past to make that seem right to them? When somebody does something total crackhead and you're looking at them going, what the holy heck could they possibly be thinking? Well, they're not thinking I'm going to do something completely against my nature, completely that I think is wrong. They're doing, it's like, based on my experience, this seemed like a good idea. To me, it doesn't seem like a good idea. To them, it might seem like a good idea. So you got to start asking the question, how could that be right? What would they have had to experience to make that right? Or even ask them. So my question, a lot of times with buyers and sellers, when we're going through this and working with your sphere of influence, say, can you please explain to me how that makes sense to you? Explain to me where that comes from and why that makes sense to you. Because for me and my experience, that doesn't really make sense. Can you explain to me, uh, so that it help, help make it make sense to you? Help me help you understand, right? Help me understand why that makes sense. And then sometimes they come up with, well, you know, I saw blah, 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 or my uncle said, or my friend did, or my parents did, or I saw this happen. You start getting this experience. Their past programming made them do it because that's what they've seen before in the past, right? So here's a perfect example, okay? So mom goes, uh, mom gets up to the holidays, and, uh, you know, it's, it's Christmas time of year, and every Christmas they make a ham, right? So mom's preparing the ham. She gets the ham out. She unwraps the thing. She takes it out, puts it on a cutting board, cuts the end off one side, cuts the end off the other side, puts it in the pan, and whoop, drops it in the oven. And her daughter comes, her daughter's watching this, and she's looking at it going, Mom, why do you cut the ends off the ham before you put it in the oven? Mom goes, uh, I don't know. Well, let me, let's get grandma on the phone. So they get grandma on the phone and they're like, hey, mom, hey, grandma. Uh, but just a quick question. I was putting the ham in the oven and uh, daughter asked, why do we cut the ends off the ham? And she goes, that's a really good question. Let me, let me get my mom on the phone. Let's get great grandma on the phone. Great grandma gets on the phone. Ah. So great grandma gets on the phone and she's like, hey, what's, what's it? She's like, why? We're just, all of us are doing this, cut the ham. We always cut the ends off the ham. Do you know why we cut the ends off the ham? And the great grandma goes, yeah, because I didn't have a pan that was big enough. So you have three generations of people cutting the ends off of hams because they saw great grandma do it. And great grandma simply did it because she didn't have a pan that was big enough for the ham. And everybody else did it just because that's what they saw her do, right? So a lot of times some of the stuff in the past program, you go, why do I do this? Why am I doing this? So as we go through this Jumpstart Masterclass, part of this is unprogramming, reprogramming, giving you new programming, knowing this is possible. If we know this is possible, believe it in faith that this is possible. You think it's possible. You feel it's possible. You're going to act differently. You're going to do the things that you need to do to make this equation work and hit that 10%. So whatever has happened in your past programming is completely irrelevant. So here's the fun part. How do you change your past programming? Vernell, how do you change your past programming? Uh, oh, crap, right? Right? <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know. For me, think differently, do differently. Yeah, so here's the thing. A lot of people, when you ask them this question, they, they kind of go, wow, I don't know. What, Russ, this is messed up, right? How do I change my past programming? The way I change my past programming is by changing what I think today. So here's the thing. I can control what I think today. 
Can I control what I thought yesterday? Nope, but I can control what I think today. So here's the thing. If I change what I think today, right, then what is this tomorrow? Here's tomorrow. What is this? That's yesterday. That's my past programming now, right? So if I change what I'm thinking today, then tomorrow, what I thought yesterday was my past programming. So can I change my past programming? Moving forward, I can. I can't go into a time machine and go back. If I did, I would have bet on the Cubs. I would have bet every dollar I had on the Cubs a couple of years ago, and I'd be a billionaire. I'd be sitting in the Bahamas, and you guys have to call me from the Bahamas, right? But since I don't have a time machine, I create my own, my thinking different today. So I'm going to control what I think today in detail, which is why we worked on our goals and we're working on our affirmations, making sure we're clear on what we're doing. And when we're clear on that, then today is my new programming, and then tomorrow, that's my past programming. And then on Friday, I've got Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday worth of programming. And then next thing you know, a year down the road, your program is completely different. Your experience and your results are completely different. So it starts today with thinking different today. And anytime something pops into your head that doesn't fit what you want, you just stop yourself, recognize it, and say, okay, that's my past programming. I'm going for this. Today, I'm moving forward. My brain's moving forward. I'm only focused on this. So when I have a thought that comes up, it's like, man, I really need more money. I'm not really doing that great. I don't have anything under contract yet. It's like, I am doing the things. I'm doing the activities that I know are going to work. They're going to produce this over time. So over the next three, four, five, six, seven months, I will end up with that same 10% ratio if I continue to do this over time. I had a guy on a call yesterday on my 100K Club call, which is basically tracking the activities from this on a bi-weekly basis. You guys are welcome to join that as you get out of this program. And we literally just go, how many points did you get? How many points are you doing? How many contacts did you get? And we troubleshoot issues that come up and scenarios that come up so that you have support and accountability to moving forward on doing the activities that are going to help you be successful. So we call that 100K Club. One of the guys yesterday, his name is James Leon Rosas. James says, Russ, you're not going to believe this, man. I have, I, I've done four weeks, exactly what you told me to do, following my, my schedule to the T. I've got two new buyers and I've got one new listing in the last week from the stuff that I've done over the last three or four weeks with you. Just from doing this stupid stuff, right? Just from doing this simple stuff. So it's, it's working, it continues to work, and if you believe it works and you do the activities, you're going to be able to move forward. Sound good? So do you have a better understanding now of how you get a different result? Goes back to here, right? So with regard to your goals, so let's, let's dig into your goals for about 30 seconds here. Do you have clearly defined goals? Jay, you can nod your head. Yes? Good. Kristen, do you have clearly defined goals? Yes. Good. Alex, you have clearly defined goals? Yep. Okay, nod the head, yeah. Vernell, do you have clearly defined goals? Yes. Jody, do you have clearly defined goals? Paul, I can't see your head, but you have clearly defined goals. I'll say she's nodding her head yes, because I know Tom Trong's over there behind her head going, yes, she does. Yes. <laughs> Good. All right. Justin, do you have clearly defined goals? He's probably doing his work thing, so he won't be able to respond or he might chat in. Ron Coleman, do you have clearly defined goals at this point? Good. Okay, so every single day, I want you to look at those goals multiple times, and anytime anything that happens that doesn't fit what you want, I want you to run its butt over with what you want, right? So sometimes, like, this isn't my experience, this is what, they're like, oh, this day's not going away. Hit the brakes. What do I want, right? Every once in a while, you guys will see me with, uh, you guys will see me with a little black marker across here. It looks like a little tri kind of tribal tattoo. I literally draw it on with a marker. I'll probably poison myself drawing that thing on there, but whatever. It's all good. Uh, so uh, I draw this thing on there, and it looks like three X's. It's like, it's like, oh, you're in the triple X. I'm like, no, 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 it's not that. That's the Roman symbol, symbols for 10,000, 10,000, and 10,000. So my current goal is to make $30,000 a month passive. So every time I'm having one of those days, you'll see that thing on my wrist every once in a while. I literally just draw it on there with a thick pen or a little Sharpie, and I'll draw it on there. And then as I'm doing my stuff going through my day, it's like $30,000. I'm not stopping. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to get there which makes me feel like, yeah, I got this, right? I've already got a good chunk of it, but I'm going to keep moving forward. Here's, here's the fun part. When I get to that 30, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to add another X. That's 40, right? And then I'm going to add another X. That's 50. I'm not stopping until I hit 100. Okay? $100,000 a month passive is what my ultimate goal is. But right now I'm aiming for 30. Got to get to 30 before you get to 100, right? So my goal is very realistic, very believable, very achievable over the next year or so. 
and it makes me feel like doing what I need to do. Helps move forward, okay? So those goals, you gotta find those things, and if you get a moment where you're like, hey, this isn't going exactly like I wanted to, find some way to do that. There's another technique that I've used. I don't have one directly in front of me here. There's another technique that I've used. If you're really struggling with something as a negative thought, one of the things I want you guys to start thinking about doing consistently is if you can take a rubber band and put a rubber band on your wrist. Have you guys ever heard of that technique? I call it elastomeric behavioral modification device. <laughs> rubber band on the wrist, right? You put the rubber band on your wrist, and anytime you have a thought that doesn't support your clear, clearly defined goals, you give that thing a little snap, and a little marker of pain says, hey, pay attention here, and then you replace it with a thought that supports your goals, right? You replace it with a thought that's like, this is what I want, and damn it, I'm going after that. Because if you keep replacing the stuff, any thought, with the stuff of here's what I want, here's what I'm doing, here's where I'm going, you're gonna feel more like doing stuff, and you're gonna be more likely to do the activities to help you move forward. Does that sound good? I know Jody, Jody, you, uh, do you feel like riding your bike every day? Not every day, but I miss it when I don't. Yeah, right, but there's some days where you don't feel like it, but- Or you're it's probably... raining or cold. Yeah, sure. So it's like, you don't always feel like it, but when you don't feel like it, you, if you have a commitment and you have people you know are gonna show up and you have people that you know are meeting you there, are you more likely to show up? You no, know, regardless. Which, which is why this stuff works, right? Because we've got this stuff set up where you guys now feel a level of accountability. You know somebody's looking, you know somebody's invested in your business, it helps you out like that. But that's part of the reason why you wanna stay connected to the people in your sphere and the people in your world. And if you don't have that, then start it. Find the people below you and start connecting to them and, and pull them up with you, right? So by helping others, you help yourself. Help others first, and you'll end up helping yourself, which is a very, very extremely powerful tool, and that also supports how we're building a sphere of influence business. Again, it all goes back to mindset, okay? So uh, let's see, sphere of influence. Or, okay, so you guys have started. Task from last week was what? Start, is start putting together your sphere of influence, right? So Jody, how many people do you have in your sphere of influence down written? Name, address, phone number, email address. How many do you have? How many do you have? I have just over 300. Just over 300. Name, address, phone number, and email address? Sure. Rockstar. Love it. So based on our formula, how many sales should you be able to get out of your sphere of influence in the next 12 months? 30. Good. How many have you been getting? 24, 26. Okay, so your numbers are going to go up pretty quick. Uh, you'll boost up a little bit since you're already getting that your number will probably be north of 10 percent. that would be my I need to keep on adding yeah which is good that means people like you <laughs> that's good jay how many people are in your sphere of influence um i've got 143 personal but i've also got a insurance agency so i pulled my book of business out of that and i've got 536 customers in my insurance book of business okay, perfect so 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 this is great so you got two different two different spheres Fantastic. So what we're going to talk about here next is how to sort this gear out so you get the most effective, um, you get the most effective results out of both sides, right? Sound good? Right. Yep. Good. This is a perfect day for you. Ron Coleman, how many people do you have in your sphere so far? I don't have a firm number yet. Okay, good. So cool part is that's not unusual. I have that happen very regularly when we're doing this because other things get in the way. Of moving forward so the cool part is is you don't have to have the whole list together yet next week we're going to talk about what to do with that list so you got a little bit of pressure on you now you got to get that list together for next week so you can start doing the next activity right so i'm going to tell you exactly what to do with that list next week okay so you got a little bit of time you've got to repeat free most of the time it takes people a week and a half two weeks to get this together particularly if you're doing sales you got stuff going on you got life going on you're revamping the way you do things. So what? You, uh, so how are you gonna how are you gonna set yourself up for success with that, Ron? Do you have a plan for that? My plan, no, is I'm going through my database and I'm just shooting out a text telling my clients because I've got over a thousand contacts, but I don't have. I've got phone numbers, I've got emails, I don't have the mailing address. So I'm just telling them I'm updating my database, and can you please give me your current address? Good. So. One of the techniques we talked about yesterday in 100K Club, people are struggling, you know, various people are struggling with keeping control of their schedule, family and stuff happening. One guy's got a newborn and another one on the way. And, you know, that kind of stuff goes on. Life happens, right? It's just part of the game. So one of the things that you've got to do is say, is this really important? I know you know this is really important, Ron, so you're going to do this and move forward. 
So with knowing that, the best thing you could do is just say, okay, how do I move forward on this? Just block out time slots for it, right? So for you right now, say with a thousand people, you're probably going to need six or seven hours in the next week of really digging at this to get a bunch of those in place. Because you want to have three or 400 in place, if at all possible, in the next week. So you're probably going to want a lot, certain amount of time for it. So I'd say if you block out two or three two-hour slots, so let's say Thursday, tomorrow morning from 10 to 12, I'm only working on digging my sphere out. And then Friday from 10 to 12, I'm working on digging my sphere out. That means you get a time to catch the stuff that's immediate, Im immediate emergency stuff for business. And then at 10 o'clock, I literally will take my phone and I flip my phone upside down and put it on airplane mode. And I don't touch the thing. I don't look at the thing until I'm done with that block. Because what happens is if I have that phone available and it looks, it starts tapping me on the shoulder, right? Do you control your phone or does your phone control you? I would say most people, their phone controls them. So in order to stop that, there's got to be times where you draw a line in the sand. I use airplane mode all the time with my phone. I actually go places like go to Menards and go grab shop. I go places and leave my cell phone at home so I can get some peace and quiet. Just be you and live life. And you know what? People are like, well, but if I leave home, what if an emergency happens? Every other knucklehead around you has a cell phone. You say, <laughs> hey, I've got to, I need help. Can somebody borrow a cell phone? Like, Everybody else has got a freaking cell phone. So Use theirs if, it, if you have an emergency. There's no really such thing as an emergency. There's, there's going to be five people that are offering you their phone, and there's four people shooting video of you looking like a dumbass, right? So you know, no matter where you go, what you do, there's people watching. You're, you're not going to be alone, and you're not going to have – you're not going to be in an emergency situation without a phone, right? So leave your phone away from you at times, particularly when you're doing business. High-level business activities, if it doesn't require the phone, Turn it off, put it on airplane mode for two hours, or set a timer for two hours and put it on airplane mode. And then when that bell rings, boom, you're done. Go on with the rest of your day. Pick back up where you left off tomorrow, right? So this time blocking and making these, these uninterrupted power hour type of scenarios. Like I can get so much amazing stuff done in two hours if I'm uninterrupted. It's mind boggling. I will tell you, most realtors, the amount of time they actually need to work per day is probably in the two to three hour range, aside from showing buyers and so forth. If you go in, nail it, drill it, get your paperwork hammered out, boom, boom, boom. It's like from this time to this time, I'm gonna get every one of my paperwork pieces done. So my thing when I was running 140 something sales a year, from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, Monday through Friday, or Monday through Thursday, and literally 10 to 12, it was just paperwork. Make sure you dotted I's, cross T's, handle contracts, uploaded documents, you make sure sky slope was set up, make sure every piece was in place. And then the rest of the day, I was free to do whatever I needed to do. Most days I was able to make sure everything was in place in less than an hour. I blocked out two. So I knew I could make sure I got everything done. And then I just get in. It's like, get this done as fast as possible. I don't get paid any more money for this. I'm not getting paid by the hour. So I'm not getting paid by the hour. Get it done and go do something you enjoy. So by noon, I was like, I'm done. If I didn't have everything else locked down that I needed to, I then I would take it and I'd carry it over to the next day and then button up whatever needed to be buttoned up, right? So you guys might be surprised to know this morning, first thing, 10 o'clock this morning, first thing for me was working on getting my paperwork. I've got a sky slope deal. I got a deal closing later today. It's a vacant lot with a person in San Diego, vacant lot in Detroit. I had sky slope issue, needed to upload a document, got all my documents handled, and then I'm ready for you guys right here. Boom, ready by noon. So I still live this lifestyle. If I've got stuff to do, I just block it out in that 10 to 12. That's my admin time. And the rest of the time I'm out doing stuff and growing my sphere. Okay, so you got to start figuring out that blocking out time. Good. So, Vernell, how many people do you have in your sphere? Uh, same situation. I don't have mailing addresses, but I do have about 140 right now that I'm time blocking time for. Okay, good, good. Susanna, how many people do you have in your sphere of influence? Hey, uh, uh, I'm still working on it. I just signed on um, a program that I can put all those information in and in one place so I can send them emails and see when they open and all that. So, but I have um, a full of jar, let's put it that way. Okay, good, good, good. Uh, Paula, how many people do you have in your sphere of influence? So I have 170 contacts for my phone, but I still have to go through like LinkedIn and my Facebook okay. page. Good. Okay, so you still have a little bit of work. So here's the good part, guys. I fully expected you guys to still have a little bit of stuff to do. Jay got a little bonus treat because he got a week earlier start because I had a one-on-one -on -one session with him 
the week before. So I was like, hey, make sure you get your list together. And he already had a bunch of it together. So he had a good jump start on it. But for most normal people, it takes, takes you a week or two to get this together. And then you're always going to be working on it. Just you're always working on this. So one of the things we're going to talk about more in the next couple of weeks too is time management, which I just gave you a little chunk of blocking time for Ron Coleman. Say, block out the time, make it happen, shut off all distractions, and just get in, get it done, right? Because you know you need to get it done. Once you get it done, it's easier to maintain. And then once a week for a half an hour or so, like Thursday, Thursday morning from 9.30 to 10 o'clock, that's when I play catch up on my sphere of influence. So you just block that time out like a doctor's appointment, like a workout schedule. Like Jody's like bike ride Thursday night, 5 p.m. I'm not missing that, right? This is 9.30. I'm not missing that because I know this is important. If you don't block time out for it every single week, even just 30 minutes to clean up whatever you bumped into in the last week, it starts turning into a mess, right? If you don't keep it organized, it's like a self-destroying house. Have you ever noticed even when you're not doing anything and nobody else is home, the house destroys itself? They're, they like self, they're like self-wrecking houses. I don't know how it happens, but houses wreck themselves. So you always have to be picking up and you always have to be picking up and you're putting stuff back and picking up, and putting stuff back and washing clothes. You're always doing that and you just got to schedule and block it out so you keep your, your business house clean. Sound good? Good. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Sorting your sphere of influence. So for those of you that have people in your sphere of influence, here's the next couple of steps, right? The next couple of steps on your sphere of influence are making sure we're clear on who we have in our sphere of influence. So your task for the next week, for those of you like Jay, this is going to apply to you. By the way, I'm looking at snow flurries flying outside my window for now. I don't know if you saw that. There's snow flurries flying out my window. This is bull, you know. Yeah, Ron, I'm out, dude. <laughs> I'm done, man. I'm not, I can't handle this anymore. Okay, so here's, so here's a scoop. One, the next step with your sphere of influence, and once you get the list together, is to start sorting your sphere of influence into A group, B group, C group, and D group, okay? And I'll give you a brief description of what these are. And I don't want you to overthink this. A lot of people overthink this. And they're like, well, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. When in doubt, give them, when in doubt, give them a higher status. And then you, if, you're all, if you're wrong, you could, you could always back them back out, right? So here's, here's the criteria, right? You're gonna sort them to A's, B's, C's, and D's. Okay, the first thing I want you to do is go through your list and say, okay, who on this list do I not like? Who on this list would I prefer never to do business with again? Who on this list would I rather choke than talk to on the phone? Who on this list treated me like crap as a human being and as a business person? Do you have any of those people on your list? Are some of them family? <laughs> Maybe, right? So if that's the case, what I want you to start doing is I want you to start going through that list and say, anybody that fits the criteria of, if I could avoid dealing with them for the rest of my life, I would. I want you to put them on the D list and dump them. Now you might say, well, Russ, I can't do that. They're a potential business. No, they're a potential pain in the ass. And if you have people in your system that you know are going to be a pain in the ass, that have been a pain in the ass in the past, you're not going to need them anymore because you're going to have that 10% hit rate and you don't have to do business with people you don't want to do business with and don't like doing business with. If they're not respectful, they don't treat you well, they don't follow the rules, they make it a pain in the butt, they turn it into a three ring circus, dump them. There's a lot of realtors like, I don't know if I can do that. Yes, you can do it, right? Because if you want to have a good business, I didn't see, when we were talking about goals last week, not a single person in here said, I want to do a bunch of business. I want to make a bunch of money. And I'm totally cool with it being a pain in the ass. Not a single person said that, right? You want to do good business with fun people and enjoyable to be with. You want to have smooth transactions. So when somebody says, I want three transactions per month, I want three smooth transactions per month, right? I want to do transactions with people that want to invite me over for dinner and I want to show up because they're awesome. Those are the types of people I want. So if my thinking is those are the types of people I want, that's what I'm most likely to attract. So if you're attracting people that are crappy, then you got to start thinking, what am I thinking? If I change my thinking, I'm going to change what I attract, right? Happy, smiley people attract more happy, smiley people. It's like secret 101. Happy, smiley people attract more happy, smiley people. Grouchy, not smiley people attract more grouchy, not smiley people. Have you ever noticed that the biggest a-hole in your real estate office back in the day was like, there's, there's always that one guy, right? And then you get some new guy in and you're like, whoa, this guy's almost as big of a jerk as the other guy. And then you say, oh, wait till these two clowns get together. They're going to butt heads like crazy. 
And these two clowns get together, the biggest a-hole you met and the other biggest a-hole that comes in, and they get together, and what happens? They become best buddies. It's the craziest thing, right? It's the two biggest jerks in the room. Nobody can get along with them, but they get along great with each other, right? It makes no sense at all, but like attracts like. It's just the way it works, right? So if you've got people in your sphere that you don't want, don't like, don't want to do business with again, dump them. If it's your mom, keep her on the list, okay? If it's immediate family, keep them on the list because you got to see them at Thanksgiving, right? You're like, hey, I never get any of your stuff. And now you got another problem on your hands, right? Just put them in passive mode, <laughs> but put them, keep them on your list. Your C group people are people that are going to be people that say, uh, I may or may not know. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, Ron. I remember Ron guy. Yeah, yeah. Who, where? I, I can't remember. I, I know I met him somewhere. That's a C group type person. So as you're going through the list, if you can't say, hey, I know this person. I know where they are. I know who they are. I remember doing business with them or you don't know any real details about them, they're gonna be a C group person. When we get to the end of this program, the C group people are people we just put in automated drip stuff. <coughs> we don't spend a ton of time, energy, and effort on them. They're gonna be in automated drip stuff because they're gonna hit at like a 1% rate, 2% rate. Because they're not like, hey man, I know that Ron guy. If I hear anybody says anything real estate, I put them in a headlock and drag them face first over to Ron and go, hey Ron, here's somebody that said real estate. You gotta to talk to this guy because you're the man, right? Those are, those are your A group people. Okay? So your B group people are going to say, hey, yeah, I know Ron. Yeah, Ron's the, uh, yeah, I know Ron, the real estate guy. Yeah, I know him. Okay? These are people that know you. They may not know a whole lot about you, but they can recognize you and they might probably know you're a real estate guy, but they don't know a whole lot of details, right? Your B group people are going to get a different package than your A group people. So what happens is you want to make sure your, your people that you have the least amount of knowledge and least amount of contact with, you're going to put them more automated. Your B group people, if you have time, are going to get more specialized, more one-on-one -on -one stuff. Your A group people are your rabid fans. They'll grab your friends by the face, drag them to you, kicking and screaming. They're like, Russ is the only guy you do business with. If you ask them this question, who's your real estate person? They look at you and they're like, you are. They don't think about it. You know, I was like, oh, do you, would you do business with Vernell or not? Well, you know, maybe, I, maybe I would. Maybe. These are people like Vernell. Hell yeah, Vernell's my favorite person in the freaking world. There's nobody else in the world I would trust to help me out with this stuff. Those are your A group people, right? People you've done business with in the past that you like doing business with are going to be your A group people. They may not be super enthusiastic and excited and all jumping up and down and have tons of real knowledge, but they've done business with you in the past. If they've done business with you in the past, they liked you enough to do business with you, you've made money off them, keep them in your A group, right? Your A group are going to be the people that most consistently are going to turn out. They're going to turn out at more like 14 or 15 percent average. And then your Bs are going to turn out at the four to five, six percent average. Your C group is going to be more like one to two. So your A group people are rabid fans. Your B group are like, I know them, but I don't know them super well. Your C group is, I know them, but I really don't know a whole lot about them. I, I met them somewhere. I kind of remember who they are. Oh, yeah, that Ron guy. Yeah, I think I remember Ron. Yeah, tall, good looking. Yeah, that's the guy. So your D group are like, get rid of them. Okay? So you're going to sort your system out. And the main key right now is say, if there's nothing else you can do, go through, take your dump list, dump out the people you don't want. So I want you to have a good business that you love. And then the next list would be start with A's. Like, who are the people like, yeah, they've done business with me in the past or rabid fans? We definitely do business with you. Those are your A group people, your most likely suspect. Let's make sure we get them at least. And then the rest of them are going to fall into the other two categories. Okay? So you're going to just sort through them. This is why I really like using Excel for stuff like this. It's super simple. You can do this in other programs, in a number of other programs. You can assign things in KB Core also. If you need more instructions on how to do that, um, ask somebody that knows how to do that better than I do. I'm not super tech savvy. But you want to make sure you get these so you can say, I can print out that group and just assign a list to them. Okay? Worst case scenario, if you go old school like me, you have your whole list together on Excel, you print the whole thing out, and I'm just going to go through it, A, B, C, D, I'm going to go down the whole list manually, because for me, it just makes it tangible, right? So in the next week or so, as you're putting your sphere of influence list together, I want you to sort them A, B, Cs, and Ds, and then next week, we're going to talk about what do we send to the A group, what are we doing with the B group, what are we doing with the C group, what are we doing with the D group? And we'll be working on various programs that will hit them as appropriate, right? So the things with the people you know and know and love are gonna be completely different, right? I'm not gonna send you to go chasing people out to have coffee with them that are in your C group that might be like, who's this? I'm sorry, I don't remember who you are. You're not gonna call people like that to ask them to go out for a cup of coffee. Your A group people, you call up is like, hey, this is Ron Coleman, you just want such basic, man, it's been a while I've seen you. I'm like, I'm gonna be in your area, you wanna grab a cup of coffee next week? 
And they're like, heck yeah, man, I'd love to have a cup of coffee with you. Boom, those are A-group people, right? We wanna make sure we give them special attention. Okay, so that's your sorting system, okay? The, uh, the next thing on your list we're gonna talk about next week, we're gonna get into more details, is going to be 30 points of success. So I wanna give you an idea of what's coming down the pipe. So you've got your sphere, you're gonna be putting that together, you're gonna be sorting that out, I want you to be repeating your goals over and over and over. If you don't have affirmations already to go with those goals, we're gonna talk about that again more next week, because now you've got two weeks of working on this. It's either gonna be sinking in or not. If it's not, we're gonna work on that a little bit next week. So next week we're gonna talk about mindset. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the sorting and make sure we're clear on the sorting, okay? If you have any questions between now and then, you can post them in the Jumpstart Masterclass Facebook group room, because that's private for just you guys and a couple of other people that have been in Jumpstart previous last couple of months. So it's a really private group just for you guys to be able to ask questions about Jumpstart stuff. And then you're gonna be sorting out your group. The next week we're gonna be talking about 30 points to success. 30 points to success is gonna help you out a bunch. So once you get your sphere of influence list together, part of this is if you wanna grow your business, like Jody's at 300 people or three or 300 people or so in her sphere, 24 or so closings, which is fantastic. So if she wants to grow her closings, all she's got to do is grow her sphere another 100 people and she'll have another 10 closings, right? So she could literally add the throttle. She could pop icon just by adding another 40 or 50 people to her sphere and delivering value to them consistently. She's going to pop icon in the next year just for making that one little shift. That's a big deal. So she just paid, what, $500 for this program? She gets a couple more sales. Boom, she's going to pop 16 grand more back in her pocket by hitting icon, which is fantastic, right? Jody, does that sound exciting to you? I am ready. Yeah, you're, you're super close, right? You're just that little tiny push and boom, so you're gonna get 16 grand back in the next year for spending five and you're gonna make your life easier, which is good, right? Okay, so 30 points of success we're gonna get into next week. That is a tracking system, is a sheet of paper. I'm going to make sure you guys all have a copy of that before you get on the call next week so you can actually see what I'm talking about and it's going to be tracking numbers of what do you really do on a weekly basis. How many calls you make, how many mailings you make, how many face-to-face -face you do, what do you do? Whatever your recipe is, you can plug it into here. And the goal is to get 30 or more points every day of business building, money-making activities. What we find a lot of times in real estate is people are saying, hey, I'm really working hard on my real estate business. And I say, what are you working on? And they tell me what they're working on. It's like, well, they're working hard on non-money-making activities. So what we're doing is we're going to say, okay, let's focus on the money-making activities. And then if you want to fill up the rest of your day with nonsense stuff, knock yourself out. But you've got to get the money-making activities done every single day. That's a number one priority. At the end of the week, you should have at least 150 points. If you don't, then that means you haven't been doing the things you're supposed to be doing to help you grow your business and take good care of your sphere of influence. The cool part is, for a lot of you guys, you're going to find there's some stuff on there really easy to do. And consider, you're like, if all I do is meet three people a day, I, I can get all my points? Yeah, absolutely. So if you show up in a networking thing, talk to somebody about real estate, you bump into three of those tonight, then you'd be good for the whole day. You don't have to piddle your whole day away pretending like you're busy. Just do the stuff that you need to do and then shut it down and enjoy life. And when you're enjoying life, do more things that you enjoy. Jody, go for a bike ride with a different group. Go for a bike ride with another group and meet more people in those groups. And then you're doing things you like and you're meeting people doing things you love and you're adding more people to your A group list, which is fantastic, right? Okay, so next week, guys, I wanna make sure we're clear. Next week, we will be doing this on Thursday at noon, okay? Thursday at noon next week, not Wednesday, Thursday at noon next week. There is a big event here in Detroit. Uh, well, it's like the next Tuesday Tuesday and Wednesday next week. There's an event here in Detroit with, uh, I believe, even Dave Kennard is showing up, the president of EXP. Uh, Pat Hayes and some of his people, Tracy Lewis, people at Team Disruptor, are coming into town to do a um, attraction seminar for Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday. So uh, I was asked to actually speak at that, so I'll be showing up there, making sure I'm shaking hands, kissing babies, meeting our Detroit peeps again, and uh, I've got a little session that I'm going to be doing talking about how to use a real estate market update to look like an expert and attract real estate agents. So one of the things we're going to talk about in this program in the next couple of weeks is doing a good real estate market update to be able to deliver to your customers so you look like an expert, and I'm going to show you how to leverage that to actually attract real estate agents. So when you do this properly, real estate agents will say, heck yeah, I want what you got. And then the next time you talk to them and say, hey, 
uh, did you get the thing? I said, yeah, great. Hey, well, you know, I'm going for, I'm going to be in your area. You want to grab a cup of coffee? And they're going to say, yeah, heck yeah. I'd, I'd love to sit down and have a cup, cup of coffee and chat shop with you. And I'm also going to talk about like when you get that conversation, how do you do that? What is the recipe? I'm going to show you guys a recipe here that works within this system. This works exactly for buyers and sellers. And this also works with real estate agents. So if you're attracting people, say, where are you currently? Where do you want to be? And then how are you going to get there? If you do that with a seller, you do that with a buyer, you do that with a real estate agent, this same recipe, we call this just simple strategy session. Where are you at now? Where do you want to be? How are you going to get there? If you can walk them through that conversation, it naturally shows them there's a gap. And that gap between where they are and where they want to be is where solutions happen. And where solutions happen, we get paid. Good, right? So I'm going to show you guys how to apply that as we go through. Applies to listings, applies to buyers, and you can move through. If you want a recap of this, I'm going to have this recorded. I'll be saving this out uh, so that you guys can look at this again if you need to. Just reach out to me and I can shoot it over to you once I get it uploaded. And also, you can go on Jumpstart Masterclass, the online version. You can look at session one, session two. You can do repeats of these if you want. A little bit more mindset. I'm adjusting this a little bit for you guys. And I'm moving up 30 points of success so you guys have a, a little quicker jump on that than I normally do. But uh, got good plans for you guys. Thanks for being here. Let me know if you need anything. Reach out via the Jumpstart Masterclass, or you can always reach out through me to chat or whatever. You get stuck on something, okay? You get stuck on something, let me know.